Good morning. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the uh, conference organisers for accepting this abstract for oral presentation. Uh, and I'm delighted on behalf of Vive Healthcare to present the first analysis of the 48-week data from the modern study. The primary objective of this study was to compare a regimen, a two-drug regimen of Maravaroc in combination with boosted darunavir versus a standard of care or reference three-drug regimen of tenofovir FTC also with boosted darunavir uh, in antiretroviral naive subjects. So why did we undertake this study? There are a number of key uh, bullets here regarding the rationale. Uh, in 2014, of course, we live in a world with very good nucleosides, but toxicity remains an issue in sub-subjects. So this was a nucleoside toxicity sparing regimen. It was also a QD regimen, and we know that simplicity and once daily uh, is good for patients uh, and potentially improves adherence. We also know from the characteristics of both Maravaroc and Darunavir that in the event of virological failure, there is a low risk of resistance uh, with the benefit of preservation of future treatment options. We also know that Maravaroc shows good penetration into CSF and genital secretions, and therefore it's a good candidate for a study uh, of this type. Moreover, the registration study Motivate and PK studies support the use of Maravaroc 150 milligrams once daily with selected ritonavir-boosted PIs. And last but not least, we know that the prevalence of CCR5 tropic virus is greatest in treatment-naive individuals. Now, one of the key secondary uh, objectives of this study was to prospectively compare tropism testing, either trophile or genotypic testing, and this is the first time that this has been undertaken in a large randomized controlled trial. So for that reason, there was a two-stage randomization in this study. So during screening, eligible patients were randomized first to have tropism determined either by trophile or by genotypic tropism assay from Siemens Healthcare. R5 tropic subjects were then randomized one-to-one -to, -one to one of two treatment arms. So they either received tenofovir FTC plus boosted darunavir with Maravaroc placebo, or they received the two-drug regimen of Maravaroc 150 milligrams once daily plus boosted darunavir with tenofovir FTC placebo. And the Maravaroc arm of this study will be shown in green throughout this presentation for clarity. So this was a phase three randomized double-blind trial. The primary endpoint was the proportion of subjects with HIV RNA less than 50 copies at the week 48 time point by the FDA snapshot. So it was a non-inferiority study with a non-inferiority margin of 10%. It was undertaken at 195 sites in 22 countries. And I think you're all aware that the study was terminated on the 4th of October 2013 upon the recommendation of the Independent Data Monitoring Committee on the basis of an efficacy in favour of the three-drug arm. So this is the subject disposition. So following the screening visit, and 1,423 subjects were screened. So those R5 tropic subjects who received one or more doses of study drug numbered 797, and they, as I say, were randomized to either the Tenofovir FTC three drug arm or the Maravaroc arm of the study. So at the 48 week time point, there were 351 subjects ongoing in the Tenofovir FTC arm and 323 ongoing in the Maravaroc arm. So if we now look at the discontinuations, you can see that discontinuations for adverse events were comparable, but clearly in the second line, you can see that for insufficient clinical response, there were 33 for Maravaroc versus eight for Tenofovir FTC. So these are the baseline characteristics of this study. And you can see in common with many, many studies in, in art naive subjects, really uh, nothing very surprising here with a median age, uh, 37 for Maravaroc and 35 for Tenofovir FTC. 
Most subjects were male, most subjects were white. In terms of CD4 counts, less than 200 copies. We had 9.5% for Moravarok, 11.2% for Tenofovir FTC, and about 20% of subjects in each arm had a high viral load greater or equal to 100,000 copies. So this is the virological and immunologic response, and you can see out at the 48-week time point in the Tenofovir FTC arm, 86.8% of subjects had achieved less than 50, whereas in the Moravarok arm, 77.3% of subjects had, uh, had achieved less than 50. So the adjusted treatment difference is shown here with the confidence intervals. So the, so, so the study had failed its non-inferiority margin of 10% uh, and the study was terminated. If you see below, we see the CD4 count changes and the mean CD4 cell count changes uh, out to 48 weeks were comparable across both arms of this study. Now, if we look at the treatment response at week 48 by key subgroups, you can see that in the Moravarok arm, there was a greater difference in efficacy in the higher viral load strata, 65.4 versus 79.5, than in the lower viral load strata. If we then look at treatment response by baseline CD4 count, if you concentrate on the green bars, you can see a stepwise increase in the treatment response according to the baseline CD4 count, with 81.9% of patients less than 50 where the CD4 count was greater than 500 uh, on the far right. This is interesting because uh, this increase in, in, in efficacy in relation to baseline CD4 count is also a feature of some of the other two drug regimens. Notably, we saw it in the MIDAS study, a small pilot like the single arm of this study. We saw it in the 1078 study that Vive undertook prior to 1095. That was a study using boosted atazanavir and Moravarok once daily. It was also seen as a feature of the NEAT study, NEAT001 study, looking at raltegravir uh, and boosted darunavir that was presented at Croy earlier this year. Now, as I said, a key secondary endpoint of this study was to look at the utility of the two methods of uh, trophile and genotypic testing. Uh, and we can see from here uh, what we did see, and this is an important uh, outcome from this study, is that we got comparable outcomes in terms of these two methodologies in predicting a clinical response to Moravarok. So 80.7% for genotype, 74.4% for trophile, uh, so slightly numerically in favour of genotypic testing, but these, the, uh, these results were not statistically significant. So I think an important take home from this study is that we can have confidence that both methodologies are good at predicting a response to Moravarok. Now let's look at protocol-defined treatment failure. And again, if you look at the green box with Moravarok and Darunavir, if you concentrate on the first two rows, we see 22 and 5. And so we can see that the majority of subjects with protocol-determined virological failure, i.e. 68%, failed with an HIV RNA less than 400 copies per mil. Interestingly, seven subjects in both arms subsequently went on to achieve HIV less than 50 copies at the last dose. This is all in, also interesting because in the 1078 study with Moravarok and boosted atazanavir, one of the characteristics we noted was blipping with subjects failing but subsequently going on to resuppress, though in that study we could observe out to 96 weeks. Also importantly in this study, we saw no treatment emergent resistance to any study drug. Now, if we turn to treatment emergent adverse events, malignancies, and laboratory abnormalities, if we look first at the most common adverse events. There was slightly more diarrhea in the Tenofovir FTC arm, but otherwise adverse events, nothing really jumps out uh, across the two arms of the study. 
Now, if we look at malignancies, we do see a numeric imbalance in malignancies. You can see seven for Moravarok, two for Tenofovir. One of these seven was deemed by the investigator to be possibly treatment-related. That was a complicated case. In fact, it was a subject with a lymphoma uh, in the context of Epstein-Barr virus and immune reconstitution syndrome. So I think it's worth acknowledging that uh, during the clinical development program for Maravarok, there were concerns about malignancy because of its mechanism of action, but I think I would remind people that we have followed this up and the five-year data for both the registration studies, uh, Merit and Motivate, has shown no increase in malignancy uh, in these studies out to the 240-week time point. Finally, grade three, four abnormalities. Again, no real significant difference across the two arms of the study. So in conclusion, Moravarok 150 milligrams QD in a two drug therapy demonstrated statistically lower rates of viral suppression when compared to a reference three drug regimen of tenofovir FTC plus boosted darunavir in art naive subjects over 48 weeks. The IDMC recommended the study be terminated in October 2013. There was comparable efficacy by the tropism assay used for screening. The majority of protocol-determined virological failures occurred with a viral load less than 400 copies, and we saw no treatment emergent resistance in either arm of this study. We also saw comparable safety and no unexpected safety findings. We continue to explore the potential of Maravarok in combination with a boosted protease inhibitor and the efficacy of Maravarok plus a boosted PI as stable switch therapy is under evaluation in the ongoing March study. So all that remains is me to thank the subjects and their supporters, Charles Craig uh, for, for his virology support and Marilyn Lewis, uh, my colleagues at Vive Healthcare and Pfizer, and of course, too numerous to mention, but thanks to all the modern study investigators and their subjects for a study conducted very well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There are eight microphones. Uh, Dan, I think you're at number three. Uh, Dan Kretzka is from Boston. Uh, you mentioned that there was no treatment emergent resistance, and I'm not sure if you're including in that uh, an assessment of whether there was emergence of CXCR4 using virus. It's very interesting that you had a, what looked like a significant trend towards increasing failure risk with lower CD4s, and of course, CXCR4 using viruses are more common at lower CD4 counts, and they might have been present and undetected as minority variants that then emerged on therapy. We saw no emergent X4 in this study. Were you able to test the uh, viruses from patients with less than 400 copies, or were those not tested? No, no, in, in invaluable subjects, of course, yes. Uh, Anton, microphone two. Tom Posty at London. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think you used the wrong dose uh, of Maravarok at 150? I mean, Darunavir is a, a metabolizer, an inducer of metabolism, and, and perhaps, so, although you, had, you, you, you alluded to some PK data, one of the worries is that the, uh, the dose of Maravarok should have been 300 and not 150. Because a lot of the response you, we saw in this study looked a bit like giving uh, monotherapy PIs to patients where they, they come down but they don't quite get undetectable. So I wonder if you've got any evidence for or against this hypothesis. Uh, no, I don't think we used the wrong dose. Uh, we know that the Maravarok exposure is necessary for a, mere, uh, 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 a near maximum maximal efficacy is a, a C average of 75 to 100 nanograms per mil uh, and a C min of 25. And a number of studies prior to modern supported uh, that target. Uh, in the 1078 study, again that was with boosted atazanavir, uh, we looked at PK and that target was met. There are a couple of small t uh, pilot studies that also provided very good efficacy for Maravarok 150 in combination with a boosted protease inhibitor. One of those was the small MIDAS study using boosted darunavir, so that was, this was a bit like the single arm of, of the modern study. That, that study showed very good efficacy with efficacy over 80%, and PK analysis of that study supported 150 milligrams. The Veeman study, which used, used boosted lapinavir in combination with 150 milligrams once daily, 
also provided excellent efficacy, and again, the PK targets were met in that study. There was also a PK drug-drug interaction study between boosted darunavir and 150 milligrams of Maravaroc. Uh, and last but not least, if we look at a sub-analysis of the Motivate studies, uh, Maravaroc in combination with 150 milligrams uh, with either boosted atazanavir or boosted uh, lopinavir, there was little difference in efficacy whether Maravaroc was given either once daily or twice daily. Yeah, but I I'll, think... Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> I guess you anticipated that question. I anticipated yeah. <laughs> that question. Uh, that was a good rehearsal. The Thank thing you. Is that, uh, I just want to know in this study whether you had any PK data to reassure me. Well, be, uh, no, we, be, be, because of our confidence in 150 milligrams, uh, we, didn't, we didn't build PK analysis into this study. But I would add, uh, adding, um, increasing the dose to 300 milligrams actually would have increased the potential for adverse events it wouldn't necessarily have, uh, have given a sufficient tail uh, to perhaps make the, the study more forgiving. Obviously, if you'd gone to 150 milligrams BID, that might have been better, but we were testing a, a once-daily hypothesis. Uh, retrospect's a wonderful thing, but we will be exploring the hypothesis that the study failed because of non-adherence. So we're going back and looking at stored samples uh, and, and looking at, uh, at, at the PK in those to see if that hypothesis is confirmed. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.